We have attained a quorum with Council President Clark, Councilman O, and Councilman Johnson is appointed to the committee. Um, Ms. Uh, Marconi, will you please read the title of the first bill before us today? Bill number 170401, an ordinance amending section 17-2102 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Council Review of Contracts with Certain Entities to Restore the Exemption from Council Review Provided in the Home Rule Charter for Certain Contracts Between the City and the Support Center for Child Advocates Under Certain Terms and Conditions. Julie Our Wertheimer. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Please identify yourself and proceed. Yeah. Julie Wertheimer, Chief of Staff, Criminal Justice, Managing Director's Office. Please proceed. Good morning, Chairman Greenlee, Council President Clark, and members of the Committee on Law and Government. My name is Julie Wertheimer. I'm Chief of Staff for Criminal Justice for the City of Philadelphia. I'm here to testify in support of Bill Number 170401, introduced by Councilman Greenlee, which restores the exemption from Council review provided in the Home Rule Charter for certain contracts between the City and the Support Center for Child Advocates under certain terms and conditions. Since its founding in 1977, the Support Center has trained more than 8,000 attorneys who contribute pro bono services to protect children. This legislation exempts the Support Center from City Council review for their contract to provide counsel for children who cannot be represented in legal matters by the Defender Association of Philadelphia or another provider due to a conflict. This is a core function of the justice system and a service the city is obligated to provide. In addition to representation, Support Center provides social workers to address the child's needs while under the agency's representation. This exemption will allow the administrative process to award and conform their contract, as well as make timely payments on invoices more expeditious. I respectfully request that council rules be suspended to allow for the first reading of this bill at the next council session. I thank you for your consideration, and I'll be happy to answer any questions at this time. Uh, thank you, Ms. Wertheim. Just for the record, this kind of puts the uh, Center for, uh, Sports Center for Child Advocates back where they were before, yes. basically, right? They, uh, without getting into a whole lot of detail, they kind of got caught in the middle of a dispute between the administration and, and uh, council last time. I think councilman, former Councilman O'Brien was right in the bill he put in, but it was not, the, the intent was never to, uh, to in any way cause problems for the Sports Center because they do a great job in, uh, in their representation. Any questions, comments? Seeing none, anyone else here to testify on bill number 170401? Seeing none, let's all work this quickly. The next bill, Ms. Marconi, please. Thank you. Thank you. Bill number 170204, an ordinance amending chapter 10-200 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Ethic Intimidation and Institutional Vandalism to clarify and revise its scope and related penalties all under certain terms and conditions. Rue Landau. Good morning, Rue. Good morning, how are you? Hey, how are you? Please proceed. Sure. Uh, good morning, Councilman Greenlee and members of the Law and Government Committee. I'm Rue Landau, Executive Director of the uh, Philadelphia Commission on Human Relations the city agency that enforces the anti-discrimination laws, particularly the Fair Practices Ordinance, and resolves community conflicts and advances positive relations in Philadelphia's diverse neighborhoods. I am here today to offer my support for Bill 170204 that would amend the Philadelphia's ethnic intimidation and institutional vandalism law to expand the scope and punishment from vandalism motivated by hate. I'd like to offer special appreciation to Councilman Johnson for introducing this important piece of legislation. Since the presidential election in November 2016, Philadelphia, like most cities around the country, has seen a significant increase in hate crimes and bias incidents. From racist graffiti, including symbols of the swastika, to physical attacks, including one against a woman for wearing a hijab, manifestations of hate have touched us everywhere. Among these incidents has been the desecration of multiple cemeteries, most of which have been Jewish burial grounds. In February 2017, more than 500 headstones were overturned at Mount Carmel Cemetery in Wissanoming. And just last month, five headstones were overturned at Adith Jeshurun in Frankfurt. Across the country, desecration at cemeteries in Missouri, New York, and elsewhere have hit the headlines. 
Vandalism at cemeteries is not new nor limited to Jewish sites, but these targeted attacks have widespread effects since they, since they hit at the cultural identity of religious or ethnic communities. They also send a ripple effect of fear throughout communities and neighborhoods surrounding the site. On a personal note, I have family buried at both the Jewish cemeteries that were vandalized and was relieved to learn that their gravestones, especially that of my beloved grandmother, were untouched. But I still grieve with the families of those whose graves were attacked. At the PCHR, we have been tracking bias and hate incidents that occurred in the city since November. To date, we have received reports of 61 separate incidents. According to law enforcement, 11 of these reports were not hate-related, 12 are confirmed, 45 are still unconfirmed. Since many of these incidents involve vandalism to property, it is very difficult to find the perpetrators of these acts. But regardless of the criminal outcome, the PCHR responds to these incidents from a community perspective. After any hate or bias incident, our community relations division works to bring people together to help the community heal and hopefully become stronger. For instance, Following the desecration of headstones at Mount Carmel and the vandalism at uh, Temple Menorah Knesset Chai Synagogue, we were instrumental in bringing together the mural arts program, the Interfaith Center, and local no neighborhood associations to create a positive neighborhood response in Wissanoming. The city's Ethnic Intimidation and Institutional Vandalism Ordinance covers conduct performed with the intent to injure another person or group of persons or his or her property because of such other persons or groups, race, religion, or national origin. It is important to note that in 2014, council passed another law, now at section 10-2200 of the code, titled hate crimes, that also covers people based on sexual orientation, gender identity, gender, and disability. Under the code, institutional vandalism is broadly defined as intentionally desecrating, vandalizing, or defacing facilities such as places of religious worship, cemeteries, or any courthouse or historic monument. Bill 170204 would amend certain subsections of the ordinance to include any property located in any facility, including but not limited to any headstone, grave marker, or grave site. In addition, the bill would increase the penalties so that each act of ethnic intimidation and each act of institutional vandalism, included, um, including each act of vandalizing an individual headstone or grave marker, would constitute a separate violation subject to monetary fines of a class three offense and upon this third successive violation, imprisonment of 30 days. The recent spike in hate and bias activity in 2016 and 2017 is disturbing and contrary to the ideals of the Quakers who founded Philadelphia as a city of brotherly love, sisterly affection, and a haven of religious freedom and tolerance. It is inspiring to see law enforcement, our elected officials, and communities throughout Philadelphia work together to stand against hate and bigotry. Bill 170204 will bring us one more step in that direction. I'm happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, again, as we say all the time, thank you for all the work you do and your commission does, and certainly on the quick response to these issues. Before I recognize Councilman Johnson, just one question. Um, the, um, you, you talk about to date since November, you received reports of 61 separate incidents. Mm -hmm. um, any comparison to how that is over a, a, a representative period of time in the past? It's very hard for us to compare what's happening now to the past. We have a very antiquated computer database system, which the city is we thankfully can to that, working yes. on. <laughs> very antiquated. <laughs> we, in general, over the years, have worked with the police on some of these incidents, but certainly we have um, created cases on our own. We call them intergroup conflict cases, ITGs. And last year, for the, for usually the full year, we work on about 30 ITGs. We're definitely not counting capturing all the work because of our lovely database system. But what we have now is an Excel spreadsheet. And we are uh, working uh, as closely with the police as I have seen in the nine years that I've been at the commission. Uh, Any time an incident occurs that could be bias or hate related, we are immediately being contacted 
uh, with the incident. We're getting updates from the police on their activity, and we're going out to do our own investigation. So it's hard to compare the 61. Um, my, you know, just personal experience and response is we've doubled last year already. That's one thing we don't want to increase, right? No, <laughs> absolutely. All right, thank you. Uh, I want to recognize Councilman Johnson. Thank him for initiating this effort. Mm -hmm. Councilman yeah. Johnson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Landon, for the work that you have been doing um, through the Philadelphia Human Relations Commission. So I, I want to acknowledge your hard work and your dedication in addressing these types of issues in all forms of hate and discrimination. And I also encourage you, as well as the administration, for the record, um, that, that hopefully they will be supportive of your budget request as you move forward so you can um, improve um, your data collection um, system that's a part of the Human Relations Commission because I think uh, most importantly when you, when you address these particular issues we're only effective if you have the resources and the support mm -hmm. behind you and so when you have um, these types of incidents of hate, other incidents of discrimination, um, you should have a full backing and support of the city of Philadelphia, and so I don't have a problem, and I'm quite sure the chairman don't have a problem um, being your champion and being supportive of your efforts as you um, seek to expand um, your data collection um, system. Um, in this particular case, uh, you know, we want to make sure we send a clear message um, to those who I consider cowards mm -hmm. who engage in the desecration of the Jewish um, cemetery headstones at these Jewish cemetery, at the cemeteries of the Jewish headstones throughout um, the city of Philadelphia, particularly in the northeast part of the city of Philadelphia, and also we don't condone any forms of hate for any, in any, any, any individuals, regardless of their backgrounds. But in this particular case, we want to make sure that um, those who I consider cowards, you know, who um, hide behind rather social media, rather it's coming out in the evening, engaging in desecrating, um, in this particular case, headstones or um, desecrating um, houses of worship, um, those individuals should be prosecuted and get a clear message from the city of Philadelphia that it shouldn't be tolerated, will not be tolerated. So we thank you for stepping up to the plate. I thank you for being here today and we'll continue to stay on the case. Um, this is something I've always been passionate about just by uh, me um, having um, a full understanding of the civil rights movement here, mm -hmm. um, not only in the city of Philadelphia, but all throughout the country. It's always been a, an agenda and something I'm passionate, passionate about, making sure that um, all forms of hate isn't tolerated, rather I'm elected official or not. That's just my background, that's just what I come from. So I sincerely thank you for being one of the key leaders in the city of Philadelphia addressing this issue. Thank you so much. One of the, we appreciate you so much and uh, moving on issues like this. One of the things that I um, love about um, the, when we amend laws and get to, mm -hmm. to put um, these issues out in the press is they actually act as a deterrent to mm -hmm. the crimes. And some people ask throughout the state, like, oh, you passed this law, how many new cases did you get? Not that many, because what we needed to do was send a clear message, message. that the city of Philadelphia right. will not tolerate this activity, so every household knows this in every neighborhood of the city, and that we could just move forward doing the real work that we need to do, which is bringing people together. And, and the unique approach about this legislation, and, and it was brought to my attention by uh, my staff, is that the penalties would be per headstone, mm -hmm. as opposed to uh, one yeah, incident really. as a whole. And I think that sends a real clear message that if you are caught and apprehended, that you will receive a hefty fine as you should be. Mm -hmm. So, well, thank you very much, thank Ms. Thank you. Landon. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you very much. Thank you for all the work you do. Uh, Ms. Marconi, I think we have a couple more witnesses on this bill. Rob Riker and Brett Goldman. Are either here? Oh, okay. Come on up. Please identify yourself for the record and proceed. Good morning. I'm Rob Reichard. I'm the Vice President of the Wissanoming Civic Association. Go ahead. Um, I'd like to just share a little bit about Wissanoming. Uh, we're a community nestled between Frankfurt, 
Mayfair, Bridesburg, and Tacony. Uh, in many ways, our community had lost its identity. We're a community without a bank, without a library. Um, we, while many of the trendy communities in the city have coffee shops on every corner, we don't have one. Um, real estate agents have started talking about our community, referring to us as East Mayfair, or just referring to us as the Northeast. Um, we're also, we learned recently, one of the most diverse communities in the city. This doesn't surprise me. On my block alone, we have Asians, Latinos, um, African Americans, Caucasians, a lesbian couple, and myself, a gay man. Um, and we work together. Uh, a couple, there's good things happening in the community. There's a new shopping center opening, which will bring us a grocery store and some national chains. St. Bart's recently sold its abandoned parish school to New Cortland Services, going to bring senior services to our community um, and take care of a, what was a vacant property. Um, our civic association was restarted a few years ago uh, with, with the help of Councilman Heenan. Um, in the last couple of years, we started trying to instill community pride. We have an annual Christmas tree lighting, a spring cleanup day on Torresdale Avenue, street banner, Wissanoming street banners, and we started to, and we participate annually in the Mayfair Thanksgiving Day Parade. We're really working to try to instill that sense of pride in our community by these cleanup days, et cetera. The desecration of Mount Carmel Cemetery in our community hurt those efforts. When my neighbors and I woke up and saw our neighborhood on the national news, not with a positive story, but with a negative story, that hurts our neighborhood, and it hurts us as a community. Our response, um, State Representative Count, uh, Jared Solomon approached us about doing a town hall after one of our Civic Association meetings. To be honest, I was nervous about what that would, the outcome of that would be. I was truly impressed by my neighbors from all backgrounds who were alarmed and wanted to do something. They asked that we start doing educational programming in the community around diversity issues. We, within two weeks of the event, held an, a candlelight walk for peace in Wissanoming Park with over 50 people attending on a very short notice on a cold and um, unpleasant night in March. You know, while our neighbors in Mayfair are planning our Thanksgiving Day Parade and our neighbors in Bridesburg were planning Memorial Day Parade, we were planning a walk for peace. Um, we're proud of that now, and we're going to take ownership of our diversity, and this walk for peace will probably become an annual event. But the harm that this kind of activity brings to the neighborhood and our sense of neighborhood pride cannot be overcome by a walk or street banners. We need to stop it from happening in the future, and that's why the Civic Association is here to support the bill. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Very if I could just add, Mr. Ray, on the issue of uh, neighborhood identity, keep fighting to make sure you're called Wissanoming. Uh, we will. A number of years ago, uh, as a resident of Fairmount, everybody wanted to call us the Art Museum area, and we right. wouldn't let it happen, so we're still Fairmount, so thank you're you, still Wissanoming, okay? Yes, we, we, were, <laughs> we are owning it, we are owning our diversity, uh, and taking pride in both. So, okay. thank, thank you, you very much. Mr. Goldman. Good morning. Good morning. Chairman Greenlee, Councilman Johnson, Councilman O. It's nice to see you back in action. Uh, my name is Brett Goldman, and this morning I'm here in the capacity as a member of the Domestic Affairs Committee of the Jewish Community Relations Council of the Jewish Federation of Greater Philadelphia. Uh, I am here to express the support of the Jewish Federation of Greater Philadelphia for Bill 170204 introduced by Councilman Johnson in the wake of unprecedented resurgence in anti-Semitism over the last several months, both locally and nationally, for reasons which are complex and yet to be fully understood. 
Highlights of anti-Semitic incidents from the past eight months include graffiti with Nazi imagery across the city, including on my own street on 15th Street, just a few blocks away from here, and the egregious act of intimidation at Temple Menorah Knesset Chai in Northeast Philadelphia, where windows were smashed during a Friday night evening Shabbat service. However, the most high profile incident came on February 25th, 2017, when Mount Carmel Cemetery, a historic Jewish cemetery in the Wissanoming section of Northeast Philadelphia, was vandalized. As a result of the incident, over 100 headstones were vandalized or topped o toppled over, with damages amounting in the tens of thousands of dollars. Repairs to the headstones cost approximately $350 a piece, and members of our community saw an unimaginable crime become reality. In the days and weeks following the incident, numerous acts of solidarity and support were shown by our Muslim and Christian brothers and sisters, local trade unions, and state and local elected officials. The city of Philadelphia quickly mobilized to facilitate the cleanup of the site, for which we are incredibly grateful. In the days after the incident, a rally was held on Independence Mall that brought out thousands of members of our community and our allies with the message that when we say never again, we mean never again, and that hate, bias, and intimidation of any kind are not welcome in our city. Nearly $150,000 was raised in a very short period of time from across the country and other parts of the world that would help defray the cost of repairs and future maintenance of the site. In addition to the work being done on behalf of the Jewish communal institutions in Philadelphia, numerous grassroots efforts have been created and have educated hundreds of our friends and allies on the issues of anti-Semitism, civic engagement, and current events. Despite the reward that has been posted, the vandals have not been caught. We believe that the ratification of Ordinance 170204 will act as a deterrent towards future acts of anti-Semitism, bias, and hate in Philadelphia, and that the fines with this ordinance may help offset the costs of future repairs. But we hope that doesn't have to happen. Whatever the case may be, the Jewish community, our organizations, and our allies in and around Philadelphia will remain steadfast in our work to combat this deplorable behavior. I believe I speak for my entire community when I say thank you for all of the work that you have done and will continue to do on our behalf. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Coleman. I think i fair to say we're all one in this, okay? We're all together on this one. Uh, Councilman Johnson? First and foremost, I want to thank um, Brett for taking time out of his schedule and being here and providing um, your testimony in support of this bill. And it also highlights the importance that uh, we here, um, as members of council representing the city of Philadelphia, will continue to be vigilant and stepping up to the plate and addressing all forms of hate here in the city of Philadelphia. So I want to sincerely say thank you. Thank you. And Rob, representing the Wissanoming Civic Association, you know, I, I mentioned, I heard you mention how um, the Peace Walk and um, the various meetings um, may or may not have a significant impact, but on deterring these incidents, but I beg to differ and says that it will. Right. Um, the more when these types of incidents take place and you organizing your community, bringing people together, um, doing the peace walk, doing the candlelight vigils, uh, and protesting these types of incidents um, serves as a deterrent, but most importantly, it shows all of those cowards that are hiding in the dark Right, who are probably walking around the neighborhood, right, that these acts will not be tolerated and are totally unaccepted. Um, I reference the history of the Civil Rights Movement because as an African American, we always organize based upon protests, sit-downs, sit-ins, and I still believe 50 years later, 60 years later, that goes toward bringing people together, but most importantly, calling out those individuals who engage in all forms of hate. So um, stay encouraged. Keep bringing the neighborhood together. I worked at Brosburg Boys and Girls Club um, when I did an organization called City Year several years ago and, and had an outstanding opportunity, I mean, outstanding experience working in that neighborhood. And so continue to move your neighborhood forward, organizing and bringing people together. Uh, I'm a firm believer that the more people that you have working together for peace overshadow any forms of hate. And so um, thank you for being here. And again, Brett, 
um, the work that you continuously do. I know you also were promoting an event sponsored by, um, it was either Anti-Defamation League or ACLU Walk that was down at the Philadelphia Navy Yard, yes. which is in my district some time ago, that also goes toward addressing the issue of hate and bringing people, people together. Continue to, to engage in those forms of advocacy, because at the end of the day, um, it's going to take all of us to roll up our sleeves and fight back those who um, promote hate in this country. I mean, it's 2017, and we're still dealing with issues that, for the most part, we should be, we should be thinking that we're beyond. But nevertheless, that's not the environment. And currently, with the current federal leadership, that's just encouraging, you know. Glad you said that. I was about to. Uh, atmosphere of divisiveness, but at the end of the day, I believe that um, the better people in our country will prevail as we continue to move forward, as long as we continue to organize and stick together. So thank, thank you. you very much, Mr. Thank Chairman. You, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, anyone else here to testify on Bill number 170204? Seeing none, again, thank you thank both you. very much for all you do. Uh, our final bill, Ms. Marconi, please. Bill number 170564, an ordinance amending section 2-305 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Office of Property Assessment, Chief Assessment Officer's Powers and Duties, by further providing with respect to the manner in which assessments are determined for certain properties that are subject to rent restrictions, affordability requirements, and other re related restrictions, and for properties with respect to which federal or state income tax credits have been obtained, and by providing for additional reporting requirements with respect to such properties, all under certain terms and conditions. Thank you. Our first witness is... Michael Piper. And as Mr. Piper is coming up, I know there's a number of other people who wish to testify on this bill. A lot of you have put your written testimony in. I would uh, respectfully ask that uh, you uh, summarize your statements. I know some of you, there may be some questions of you too. So uh, we would uh, appreciate because we, we have two more committees, af hearings after, after this one, so we want to try to move forward as quickly as possible, but still uh, address the issue. So, Mr. Piper, good morning. Good morning, good morning. everyone. <laughs> Your team, please identify yourself and proceed. Good morning, Councilman Greenlee and members of City Council. I'm Michael Piper, Chief Assessment Officer for the Office of Property Assessment, and I thank you for the opportunity to address this committee today. With me is Drew Aldinger, Senior Attorney for the Office of Property Assessment, Donna Derschel, Real Property Evaluation Supervisor, and John Doyle, MAI of Doyle Real Estate Advisors, and for the past year, a consultant for the Office of Property Assessment. We are here to, to present testimony on Bill Number 170564, which addresses the methodologies for assessing certain rental properties that are the beneficiaries of low-income housing tax credits. Regarding the aspects of assessment methodology addressed in this bill, the Office of Property Assessment is generally in agreement with the bill's proposals. However, we do have some concerns. For recent tax years, the City of Philadelphia has valued these above-referenced taxable properties on a uniform per-unit basis while this method does not take into account the individual revenues and expenses normally factored into any calculation of market value of income producing real estate, it does recognize an agreement that these are not properties that are totally exposed to or positively affected by market forces in the same manner as other similar rental properties. These projects, long considered a desired public private partnership that encourages needed affordable housing are encumbered with some restrictions that affect market value as it is generally defined. With respect to the valuation methodologies used to value these properties, OPA has consistently recognized these restrictions that affect these business entities' bottom line from both the income and expense perspective. As per Section 402C of the Pennsylvania General County Assessment Law Act of 1933, Pennsylvania Law 853 has amended 72 Purden Statute subsection 5020-402C requiring that rent and other res related restrictions be considered when arriving at actual value of such properties 
OPA currently conforms with this requirement. Furthermore, has federal and, and state income tax credits with respect to such properties may not by law be considered as revenue that can be used in developing a net operating income? OPA does not consider these credits in our valuation methodology. The formula for which we arrive at the substantially discounted value is available upon request and certainly is part of any appeal discussion with the taxpayer whose assessment is being disputed. However, the bill proposes a requirement that OPA, quote, obtain and consult a representative sample of the annual audits of properties submitted to the Pennsylvania Housing Finance Agency, unquote, in and of itself, we have no problem with factoring in information obtained from the audits. However, the representative sample is, as with any classification of property, when we do mass appraisal, a sample taken from a universe that OPA, OPA has determined is a representative of the entire universe of properties. In order for OPA to be confident that the sample is truly representative OPA would need access to the entire universe of audits. Currently, the owners of these projects are not required to submit the audits to the Office of Property Assessment, and without having access to the entire universe of current audits for all such rental properties, a pre-selected sample, while helpful, has only a limited benefit and how it may factor into what information OPA needs to value this universe of properties on a fair, accurate, and uniform per unit basis. I thank you for this opportunity to present testimony and would be happy to answer any questions that you may now have. Okay, thank you. I assume you're all here just for... Yes. Back up? Okay. Uh, Ms. Piper, um, thank you, first of all. Uh, for, and you kind of said this, but it, is it true that basically this... Uh, the proposed ordinance is basically asking or requesting the city, requiring the city to adhere to state law that already exists. For the correct? most part, yes. Okay. As we read it. Yeah. And and, and I know you raised some, some of the issues at the end of your, your testimony. Now, you say that um, uh, the issue of representative sample, uh, as, as far as I read the bill, I mean, that's asking for the, the minimum. I don't think there's anything re uh, stopping OPA from going further, right? And asking if you if you need like you, you talk about the total universe, you can ask for that too. I mean, I don't think anybody's stopping you from doing. It. I think this is just sort of the minimum that the bill is requiring, which again is I think consistent with state law. Yeah, and, and right, and based on what we see, I, I wouldn't disagree with you, Councilman. Um, the only concern is that the sample representative or the representative sample or the randomly selected sample, um, however you want to look at it, mm -hmm. is something that um, w we need to be able to, number one, continue to define. Mm -hmm. And we define it as something that we've deemed to be representative by at least having access to the entire universe. I, I don't propose that every year we want to have to look through the entire universe of audits that right. is submitted to the agency they're required to submit it to, and, and certainly um, my supervisor sitting next to me does not have the resources on her staff to do that. Right. However, we still need to have access to it, and we would request that um, the legislation, uh, if passed, does not assume that from going from that point forward, we're only looking at a representative sample that somehow. Um, you know, someone is selected, and, and probably with good intentions in, in trying to see that that sample is representative, but we need to be able to make that decision. Mm -hmm. Or we're valuing this class of properties um, in an additional different way than the law um, prescribes. Okay. All right. Again, this isn't my bill, but I, I think, as I stated before, I, I don't think in any way it's limiting you from going farther, you know. I think okay. it was just the, 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 the baseline, if you will. Now, as far as uh, you say that these projects are not required to submit the audits to the property assessment, Correct. Um, have, have they been asked to? Um, uh, from what my understanding is, and we're going to hear from a lot of representatives of these, of these groups, um, they have them, they're willing, to, and I assume they're going to probably submit them when they appeal, but 
uh, have they ever, ever been asked to submit them? When, if, you, if you know what these properties are, mm -hmm. would it make sense to ask for these audits yes, ahead it would. of time? Yes. Okay. Yes. Have they ever been asked before? We, we haven't asked all of them. Okay. And uh, the reason is because th there's been no disagreement on the assessments, but the time in which we would ask would be when an appeal is filed or um, if, mm -hmm. if, if before we do another assessment, we see that there's an opening because they're amenable to, it's not the kind of information that we're necessarily expecting to get from everyone, to be honest with you, because um, we recognize that's the nature of assessment. You know, we, this, the taxing jurisdiction has the power to assess your real estate and essentially reach into your property. Uh, your pocket, and, and on the other hand, the, the I'm glad taxpayer, you use that word. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to be no, sort understand. of blunt without, you know, but, but on the other hand, the taxpayer also has the power to not give you information that isn't right. necessarily going to help them. So we, we understand that, and we live with those, those confines. Mm -hmm. However, on an appeal, um, the taxpayer would be asked to bring that information in. And specifically that information yeah. with these types of properties. We wouldn't ask for pictures. We wouldn't ask for um, examples of market rents for similar um, type of properties because we understand we cannot and we do not value these based on market rents. We have to look at actual rents. Right. Um, but that's the only information we would ask for on appeal. So on appeal, we're expecting to ask for this. I, I guess yeah. what I'm getting at is wouldn't it save everybody a lot of time and frustration? To get it ahead of time, I it guess. would. Okay, it would. And so going if you forward, know what these properties yes. are, and I don't know the whole mechanism of how to do this, but if you know what these properties are, and you know that that information is key, why not get it ahead of time and not have these folks have to put in appeals? I, I, I would. Very many, which they may win because they're going to have the information that, if you had, you might not have raised the assessment. That sure, high. sure. <laughs> yeah. If uh, going forward, yeah, we we will make an attempt to ask for the information for all of them. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And I would think that they, particularly if it benefits them, <laughs> which they feel it does, they would probably be very willing to put it on. And some of them are going to testify, so we'll probably it, hear that. It, it always, it benefits in general the entire system for, right. for us to have more information rather than exactly. uh, uh, limited. And again, I think that's what this bill, when we get back to it, I think that's what this bill does, I think. You know? I think yeah. it helps, in my opinion, it helps everybody. It you does. Know, including OPA. Certainly. Especially yeah. OPA. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I know you don't like to go through months of, uh, of and, the, and the board does not like to go through months of appeals, you know, so. Your, our, our goal is, is uh, not necessarily to have more appeals, but, but we expect that we will have some. Sure. You know, particularly for these because, you know, it's, uh, it, it's an issue that Quite frankly, we, we know there's, there's some sensitivity about sure. it. Yeah. But I, I'm just getting, if, if you have more information in the front, then you, don't, you might not have, I would to agree. have as many. Right. I would agree. Okay. Any other questions? Seeing none? All right. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. If you could just stay here, because there may be issues that come up with we the will. other witnesses, sure. I would appreciate it. Ms. Marconi, you want to uh, call the first little group? Uh, Walter Spencer, Joseph Bright, and Laura Weinbaum. Good morning, everyone. Still morning. Yeah, it's still morning. Okay, there, Ms. Spencer. Um, Ms. Spencer, I'm going to ask you. You start, and maybe particularly, and we have your written sure, testimony, right. but be. In, I know you have worked a lot on these is, these issues. Um, and in in your opinion, if you could start out by, how do you feel that OPA, the assessments that have been given for this year, how do you think they came to those those findings in your opinion I don't know sir okay all right the, Mr. just Piper, state state your name for the record please yeah. beg your pardon state your name for the record my, my name is Walter Spencer yeah lower that there you go there you go thank you I don't know sir I saw in his testimony this morning that Mr. Piper said that OPA had a formula mm -hmm. that they used and I'll, I'll be interested to see that formula okay when it's available okay 
Okay, if, if you want to just make your statement. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to summarize. Please, uh, let I, the record reflect Councilman O'Neill, member of the committee, is present. Please, go ahead. Thank you for allowing me to appear today. What, what I want to just summarize, because I, I know you Please. have time constraints this morning. Thank you. Uh, what I basically did was what OPA is suggesting they're going to do. The City Council technical staff provided me with a sample of 19 audits of LIHTC properties, low-income housing tax credit properties. What I did was I went through those audits line by line. I identified the expenses, the income and the expenses that are associated with the properties, determined their net income, and then based on that determination, based on determining the net income, estimated what a, a buyer would pay for those properties. In the case of Butler County, or Butler Street versus Northampton County, the Commonwealth Court ruled that this was the proper approach. And so what I want to do very briefly is summarize for you the five findings that, that I made. The 19 projects include over 1,000 apartments. The highest value per apartment was $30,000, less than the average $38,600 value recommended by OPA. The average value apartment per apartment was $9,200, 92 versus 38,600. Five of the 19 projects had negative values because they had operating losses according to their audited statements. As a group, I calculated the value of the 19 projects to be 23% of the value calculated by OPA. And I believe that if OPA obtained, the audit, obtained a sample of audits, or if they obtained all the audits, and they were to do a review, that they would develop values that are different than the ones that they included on the 2017 assessment roll. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's hear from all three and then we'll have questions. Mr. Bright, please. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of City Council. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on this subject. Um, I'm a state tax practitioner, state and local taxes, and I've been working in that field for many, many years. I represent uh, a number of entities that um, sponsor low-income housing tax credit properties, among them um, Catholic Health Care Services, which is an arm of the Diocese of Philadelphia. Um, the Federation of Jewish Agencies speaks for itself, Salvation Army, and others. Um, let me make a couple of uh, what I regard as key points. One of the prime reasons why this bill is introduced is that OPA has proposed raising the value of these properties from $22,500 in market value per unit to $38,700. And I have yet to see an explanation why every single low-income housing tax credit property suddenly was increased in value by 60-some-odd percent. Personally, I don't think that that's credible. These properties are not worth anything. They are so tightly restricted with rent restrictions out 35 years, 15 as a result of federal law, and another 20 as a result of Pennsylvania law through the Pennsylvania Housing Finance Agency. Uh, they have very little value, and they certainly do not have $38,700 Per unit. I personally have never seen or even have identified a single sale in the market of these properties while they are subject to the restrictions. Not one. There may be one somewhere in the United States, probably is, it's a big country, but I've never seen it. If they're all that valuable, where are the sales? The low income housing tax credit provisions of the Internal Revenue Code are the prime source of low-income housing in the United States. There used to be several programs that were used. This is the main one. 
by an overwhelming majority. If you cannot qualify for these tax credits, you probably cannot build this housing. There is a screaming need in this city for low-income housing. Mm -hmm. So the government should do whatever is lawful and appropriate to facilitate the construction of these properties using the benefit that the federal government is offering to people. That's the purpose of Section 42 under the code. Um, a, couple of other, uh, a couple of other quick points. Um, when a project is uh, proposed, it must be approved by the Housing Finance Agency, the Pennsylvania Agency, and they're the ones who allocate the credits. If you don't get credits from them, you don't have the credits, okay? The project has to be feasible, which means a reasonable person to look at it and say, this can actually work and won't go broke in five years. That's the point of it. So they look at the projections very carefully. Um, two points here. First of all, there is no extra money to pay taxes. There's no slush fund floating around. Uh, so if it isn't built into the rents, it's not going to happen. If you move money from the rentals into taxes, you are by definition going to reduce the number of properties of units available or make them less attractive or eliminate the community center. We're talking about moving money from one place to another. So imposing additional taxes, any taxes at all, but particularly a whopping increase like what we've got here, is going to just take it away from poor people. Uh, that strikes me as contrary to uh, good public policy. Um, most constructions like this, in fact, I guess I would say all of them, will qualify for the 10-year tax abatement. So while it's abated, it's a non-issue. But in year 11, up it comes. Um, many of these projects are up and running and were based on a 22-5 unit. And, and let's just assume for a minute that that's the correct number. I think it isn't for the reasons that I previously planned. I think it's lower, but never mind that. Put that issue aside. Where's that money going to come from on projects that were, were approved 10 years ago? And you're talking about, for the most part, projects that are sponsored by charities. So even if the charity, for instance, the Archdiocese of Philadelphia were decided to dig in its pocket and simply give the money over, it's going to come from some other, take it away from some other social purpose. And the same thing is true for all of these charitable agencies. Um, unless the OPA reconsiders its proposed increases, and I would say the increases are on the internet. If you go look at their site, get an address of a low-income housing tax credit part, a property and look it up. There it is at 38.7 per unit. You just do the math. Mm -hmm. Every single one of them. You're going to have an appeal. People like me will represent uh, the clients we serve. Take an appeal. It's not right. That's going to mean you're going to have hundreds of appeals before OPA and eventually BRT and maybe to the courts. And that's wonderful for state tax litigators like me, it's no good for the public because all it's doing is draining public and charitable money for issues that should be resolved uh, way before you get to that point. My understanding of the audits at PHFA is they're public documents. They can just write to PHFA and ask them, under the, or they could write directly to the uh, charities. To my knowledge, Anybody that I represent has never been asked for this audit, and they f would willingly give it. It's a public document. Uh, and uh, Mr. Spencer here used those, uh, and they're available to anybody. So the bottom line here to me is I think the proposed increase is way out of line. And I think the bill should, uh, I recommend should pass because I think it will reinforce the intention of the General Assembly in the restrictions that they've placed on valuing these properties and will add some additional requirements that will advance that purpose and bring these down to a value that will accommodate uh, the social policy or what should be the social policy of this city. Thank you. All right. Thank you.
Councilman, let, let's hear from Project Home, oh, sure. and then we'll have questions, okay? Uh, please. <laughs> we have your written testimony, but if you'd like to... You have them. Okay, great. Um, so, good morning, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. Sorry. Um, my name is Laura Weinbaum. I'm the Vice President for Public Affairs and Strategic Initiatives at Project Home, and a lot of what I would have said is in this document is, is a lot of what Mr. Spencer and Mr. Bright have already said. I'll just sort of sum it up by saying there are kind of four key points, I think, in this testimony. Um, the first is that the need is so overwhelmingly great that by increasing our um, assessments in this way by 60%, we will be able to actually provide less housing going forward. As you probably know, Project Home is one of the largest affordable housing providers in the city of Philadelphia with 802 units as of about a month from now uh, and another 242 in our planned pipeline, um, bringing us to over 1,000 units. And this would definitely begin to put our pipeline in jeopardy. As you probably also saw in the paper the other day, we opened applications for our new residence at 2415 North Broad Street, which is gonna be 88 units. In the first day and a half, we got over a thousand applications. People waited online for literally more than 24 hours because, I'm sure I don't have to tell you, but because the need is so great in Philadelphia. That's one. Two is that um, we believe firmly that the low-income housing tax credit is a huge economic driver. Uh, with about $8 million in um, tax credit awards, we've been able to turn that into about $75 million in equity, plus another $44 million in um, additional investments, and we raise additional money every year to support the support services that go into helping uh, people who have experienced homelessness retain and maintain affordable housing. The third is that, as Mr. Bright really beautifully articulated, the cash flow for these properties only supports the operations of these properties and our programs. It's, there's nothing else for the tax money to come out of. Um, and then fourth is that the, the valuation approach for uh, coming up with these new assessments seemed unclear to us, and um, it is likely that the city would be subject to appeals, which would be time-consuming and potentially costly um, without this being a little more clear. So in sum, um, Project Home, as you know, seeks to end and prevent chronic street homelessness in Philadelphia by providing the most critical resource needed, which is affordable housing. Increasing our property taxes by more than $94,000 a year this year and potentially as much as $170,000 going forward when our abatements expire would place a significant financial strain on us and prevent our funds from being used on behalf of individuals who need it most. We do fully support Councilman Clark and Councilman O'Neill's proposed ordinance to amend the OPA's assessment procedures. We're grateful for the opportunity to work together to find a sustainable solution to the affordable housing crisis in our city because none of us are home until all of us are home. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Ms. Weinbaum. Thank you, the, the three of you. If I just have one question, I recognize Councilman O'Neill. Uh, Ms. Weinbaum, I think this is probably best for you. Um, you heard the issues raised with Mr. Piper as far as the audits and all that. Uh, have you ever been asked for, for that by OPA, just for the record? Have we ever been asked yeah. to provide our audits? Yeah. Um, no, but they are public information. One can certainly find them on GuideStar, and we'd be thrilled to furnish them to whoever asks. Well, you answered my second question. You'd be very happy to provide them, correct? Yeah. And For would sure. it make sense if, if you provided them ahead of time, or they were provided ahead of time, that it would could very well solve, you know, Mr. Bright, maybe you can answer this too, that it could address a lot of these issues and cut down on those, uh, those appeals that, you, uh, that you're both referring uh, to? Absolutely. Uh, as <laughs> okay. I... Again, as I sit here now, I have no explanation whatsoever okay. for how they got to 387. Nothing. It's okay. not that it's unclear. It just isn't there. Okay. Huh? Okay. Thank you. Councilman O'Neill? Yes. Um, I have a question for um, Mr. Bright, but first I just want to mention that just a few weeks ago, because this bill has gotten very quick attention, um, both in, in terms of being introduced after the issue was discovered and and the hearing, and I thank the chairman and the council president for that. Um, I got an email and then a phone conversation. I had a phone conversation with Eric Nafflin from uh, Federation Housing. He runs it. And over the years, we've had a lot of interaction, and I have a lot of uh, low-income senior projects in my district, uh, most of which, the majority of which, are, are run by Federation and owned by Federation. And when he explained this to me, uh, all I kept hearing was, we're not following state law. And two, if this were put in place, not only would Federation go out of business, there's just no way they could operate. There's no pool for anywhere else. 
they just would have to shut down. And many, if not most, or if not all, of the other low-income um, tax credit projects may have to do the same thing. So we basically put ourselves, put them out of business. There's no, there's no increasing the rents. There's no, um, there's no way it's restricted. And <clears throat> so I basically said, I'm in. You know, have you talked to uh, Herb Wetzel? He said, No, but Mr. Bright has, and and uh, I don't know Joe, but I know him by reputation. He's not a local expert who does a lot of this work. He's a national expert, uh, recognized on, a, on a, a national level as uh, maybe the expert in this area. Certainly uh, without, without uh, uh, if not without peer, without anyone who would get a higher recommendation in this area. So Mr. Bright, oh, and when, when Herb Wetzel explained this to me, and for those that don't know Herb, uh, is on technical staff, uh, is an attorney, has, knows as much about housing, low-income housing, as anyone I've ever met in my life. Uh, he explained this to me in 10, 15 minutes, and while three of the four of us at the table now are attorneys, this isn't something you need to be a t an attorney to understand. It's very clear, it's plain English, and um, whether you get the part about violating state law or you get the part about going out of business if you have to do this, um, it becomes very clear that it's not complicated uh, when, when it's presented. So what, what I feel bad about is that I hate voting for a bill that has to be passed because a city agency is violating state law. I'm not even sure I've ever done it, but I certainly am uncomfortable doing it. Um, and so first I want to ask Mr. Bright, this is the question, uh, is the city OPA violating state law with what they are proposing? I would respond this way. Um, again, or not following state law, I have, violating may be I have yet to see harsher. any explanation at all for getting to 38.7 market value per unit. There okay. just is no explanation. Now, it's possible that in somebody's desk drawer somewhere there's some notes that explain how you got there, but I haven't seen it and I haven't heard it articulated. So rather than say they are not following state law, what I would say is clear and inarguable that there is no explanation whether they did file, follow state law, and if they did, how they got to that number. Personally, I don't see how you could possibly do it for all the reasons you've heard here, but the answer is it hasn't been presented. Let me just draw a bottom line here. The assessment statutes require that property be assessed at market value. That's the price at which a willing seller would sell to a willing buyer. That's the basic bedrock principle. Now you can get into capitalization and income methods and all this tricky stuff that's very interesting, but it's all geared to answer that question. These properties have little or no market value. You can't sell them because the restrictions are so tight under federal law and Pennsylvania law. The rents are tightly restricted so that they are geared only to low income or a certain percentage of low income people and you cannot violate that or risk losing the credits and that's a huge disaster if that happens so people uh, are religious if I can coin a phrase to uh, follow those restrictions and those definitely impact market value who would buy a property that's that tightly tied up for 35 years okay and do you um, agree with Mr. Nafflin that certain um, projects would have to shut down if they couldn't afford to pay this massive increase? Oh, absolutely. Because there's uh, no place to pull the money yeah. from unless there is some big charity back there behind them? Unless somebody's going to just give it. But, but yeah. if you're looking at the particular property and you can take the audited statement to PHFA, and, and those are, as everybody agrees, available on the website, <coughs> and run the math, and stick in there taxes at 38.7 per unit, and you're going to come up in the red. Okay. 
and you run any, any, any effort, whether it's business, nonprofit, what, in the red long enough, it'll go broke. That's okay. Adam Smith. I would, I would summarize your previous statement as they are, if not violating state law, not following state law. But um, what I'm really after is, um, I know this bill is going to come out of committee today, but if there's a way that we can kind of settle this by the 22nd, um, that's two whole weeks. That's as long as we've had since this bill was introduced uh, with a holiday and all holiday weekend in between. Because I, I think if OPA really sits down, reads this testimony, sits down with Mr. Wetzel, Mr. Bright, and some others, including those other uh, witnesses at the table, but um, I don't want to limit it. Uh, I think it could get a tutorial on this um, that they would understand and, and realize that um, this is a learning curve for them under the, under the full market value um, process that we've had in place now um, for, for several years. And we've done a very, very good job with it overall. Um, and we're catching up on some commercial properties. Uh, I understand this year we're, we have this windfall, which really isn't a windfall. It means we're, we, were, we could have had it several years before. Um, but, the, uh, but in this area, I think it's, it's more learning, understanding the total, not nuances, but the total uh, differential where people like your clients and, and your, your nonprofits aren't saying, We've got a really sharp attorney here who can prove that we are, have no value. Well, no value under full market is zero taxes. And no one is asking for that. No one is thinking about it. No one would ask for it. But the average, which going from the low to the high and coming up in the middle, that everyone in this group has been willing to accept uh, has worked and is workable. And that's the number everybody's working with when they do their budgets and set their rents and everything. So uh, I got a feeling that if everybody gets serious about this, uh, out of this chamber, um, we can maybe get some good news that, um, that everything in this bill uh, will be done in the future. And I just hope that's where we're going with this. Because this shouldn't be a fight. It shouldn't be whether you're filing, following, violating, or not explaining uh, what you did. It, I think it's a learning curve. And uh, everything I've seen from OPA, um, uh, they've, they've really been excellent. That's why this, uh, to me, is a, is a blip, hopefully, that can be straightened out. And it may have taken a hearing like this to get it done quickly, uh, but it was something that needed to be done quickly. So. I hope we don't have to use a, a hammer when we can use uh, just dialogue. Um, okay. And uh, that's it. Thank okay, you, Mr. Thank you. Mr. Thank you, Councilman. Um, Councilman Green. Thank you, Chairman Greenlee. I uh, wanted to thank um, both Council President Clark and Council O'Neill for their leadership in this legislation. Um, since the increase in commercial assessments, I know a number of um, small businesses on commercial cars have raised concerns um, about the increase. Um, but just learning about this issue, it, it, it does really trouble me in reference to the impact this will have on nonprofits, especially nonprofit developers across uh, the city of Philadelphia. Um, from you know, my experience working as attorney representing the Office of Housing and Community Development, um, I've seen a number of these projects over the years. Uh, and then also from my own personal experience, uh, either serving as a board chair for um, a nonprofit like Center in the Park or being on the board of the um, Germantown y, um, uh, YWCA at some point, um, YMCA, excuse me, um, and seeing some of the long of housing tax credit projects that have occurred over the years. And those projects, as Mr. Bright testified, Mr. Spencer and others have testified, that those projects have very, 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 very tight um, margins, if any margin at all, to even get the project done. And it's often, um, now put together in a very challenging way. And so I guess my question to the panel, is there any jurisdiction in the Commonwealth that is using this type of approach in assessments? And when you say this kind of approach, what do you mean? Well, the type of approach in reference to looking at in these tax credit projects in a way that is causing this type of increase that is, as Councilman O'Neill and others are saying, not quite in keeping with um, the Commonwealth. Well, if your question is, do I know of any other of the 67 counties that are doing anything like this, I do not. 
Right, and I figured that because of your national expertise and also local expertise, that would probably be the answer. And I would agree with Councilor O'Neill that hopefully um, this is a, a learning curve and that, uh, and I do have some additional questions for OPA about how they got to this approach, um, but it will come to some type of understanding that this approach would not, is not really sustainable going forward because non nonprofits in the city of Philadelphia, considering all the other issues, the already challenging resources that we have from um, lack of dollars coming on the CWG level, the, the intense competition for tax credits um, to get support at the local level uh, for home dollars and also at the state level through PHFA, that they will have a, a, different of, a difference of opinion coming out of this hearing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Just, Mr. Price, real, one real quick question. You said you have not heard any explanation yet about how they got to that figure. Have you in any way had any conversation with OPA about this? Yes. Okay. Uh, I've talked to various representatives okay. of OPA in connection with some other litigation, but the general subject was raised. Uh, and all I'm saying is I just haven't seen it. So you haven't seen anything. Okay, good. All right. Not good, but thank you for the answer. If there are any other questions, no? Okay, thank you, this panel. Uh, Ms. Marconi, why don't you call the next group, and then I'm going to make a statement before they start. Suzanne Lechiro, Beth McConnell, Angel Rodriguez, Lee Felger, and David Feldman. While they're coming up, uh, and I know Councilman Green had mentioned other questions for OPA, uh, after the finish, I'm going to ask OPA to come back up, and uh, in the spirit of what Councilman O'Neill was talking about, if we could at least start to uh, resolve what these issues are. We might not finish them today, but at least get some, uh, a couple things. So in that vein, if I could ask everybody that's going to talk, I, I think we understand the problem here. We're not disputing that, you know, you, that there might not have been accuracy done. So I'm asking everybody to be brief so we can get back to OPA because we are running, starting to run into another hearing. So most of you have submitted your testimony. If you could just briefly you know, summarize, because again, I, I think the panel gets it here, okay? So uh, I think Ms. Laredo, am I pronouncing that right? Uh, her name got called first, so. Good morning, Chairman Greenlee and Councilman. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you today about assessment of affordable properties, which provides such a significant community benefit. My name is Susanna grady Laredo. I'm with Catholic Healthcare Services of the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. In 2008, we placed our first affordable housing development into service. Since that time, we have placed two others, have one under the construction and one in pre-development, providing dignified service-rich housing to our 186 senior residents enhances their quality of life, and in many instances, has preserved their ability to live independently. This work dovetails with our mission to provide excellent care to all people, but especially to the poor, because we believe that all people are created in the image of God. Furthermore, our properties have stabilized neighborhoods, repurposing vacant schools and building infill housing that serve as anchors in these communities. Our developments are beautifully designed and are well maintained. But make no mistake, they are not market-rate housing and should not be treated as such. They exist to provide a basic need to our most vulnerable citizens. St. John Newman Place in South Philadelphia is in its ninth year of operation. We had a property tax exemption in place until we were notified last year in 2006 that it was revoked, and we received a tax bill of $24,654. That same year, we had cash flow of $5,000 and simply no means to pay that unexpected cost. We have an appeal pending and are working hard to cut expenses so that we have funds to pay some sort of property tax. But the property cannot afford to pay a tax on a $22,500 per unit assessment, let alone a higher value. The assessment must be in line with the true value of these properties and not be such a hardship that it causes the property to fail. I'm not a real estate appraiser, but the plain fact is that these projects are not saleable in any way at any price, given the rent restrictions, which now extend 35 years. These projects are not designed to make money and don't make money. They are designed to serve a social purpose. 
On a personal note, I grew up in Delaware County, but fell in love with Philadelphia as a child coming into the city with my father when he worked on Saturdays during tax season. I moved to the city in 89, and family and friends questioned why I would make the move given the wage tax. I always responded that I love Philly and I don't mind paying my fair share. I still feel that way. Right is right and I will gladly pay what is owed out of my wages and on my home. Affordable housing is different. It exists to provide for a basic need. There is no profit in our operating of these properties. Again, right is right and affordable housing must be taxed in a fair manner that will not place an undue burden on properties the value of which is not found on a balance sheet or in market rate assessment, but in the good it provides its vulnerable residents and the surrounding community. And thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. McConnell, I think you were called next. Good morning, Chairman Greenlee and other members of the committee. Uh, my name is Beth McConnell, Policy Director at the Philadelphia Association of Community Development Corporations, PACDC, and I'll summarize and shorten my testimony. We are here to support Bill Number 170564 and do urge Council to pass it out of committee and pass it out of full Council before you recess for the summer. Um, I want to point out just a couple things that haven't been mentioned yet. Uh, one is that in some cases we're seeing both the land value increase, um, and this is particularly relevant for affordable housing developments that are under the 10-year tax abatement since that results in an increase in their tax there even if the overall assessment for the property may not uh, be skyrocketing as high so I think it's important that we take a look at that um, we're also hearing grave concern from our members about where they're gonna find more philanthropic um, uh, public or other funds to pay these higher tax bills and at a time of great uncertainty about the future of federal funding for affordable homes Philadelphia should should not be making it more expensive to operate the li limited number of affordable homes we have. I want to turn your attention to the chart that's in my testimony. I just did a very cursory sample of five developments um, that contain about 243 units of affordable rentals in diverse areas of the city. All of these are developed with low-income housing tax credits and none of them are subject to the tax abatement. The abatement may have expired, um, so these may, may be our older units. And you'll see that while all of them were assessed previously in 2017 um, with a, uh, an average per unit of about 22,000, some around 24,000 per unit. Um, some have gone up to the 38,000 number that we've heard, but I've even seen one example of a unit of a project, 26 units of affordable uh, units for veterans and their families where the per unit increase is uh, an assessed value of 59,946. So I think we have to take a real careful look at a variety of different um, low-income housing tax credit and other affordable units, both rental and home ownership units, where we might not have as much data to see how they're affected by these increases. I want to also just highlight um, that these aging low-income housing tax credit properties are actually in desperate need of more subsidies to keep them habitable and keep them affordable. Philadelphia has lost more than 23,000 units of affordable rentals over a 14-year period and we're projected to lose thousands more. Preserving them requires additional subsidy to make repairs and prevent them from flipping to market rate. In fact, DHCD's FY18 budget includes 1.5 million in CDBG funds to preserve some of these units and of course that, that's inadequate. We need way more than that. So we certainly don't want higher taxes to be required requiring even greater public subsidies to keep these units affordable. Um, PACDC wants to thank the Council President and Councilman O'Neill for their leadership in introducing the bill and for working to create and preserve more affordable homes for low-income Philadelphians. And we would be happy to work with Mr. Piper and his team at OPA um, to uh, generate a list of properties that could be part of a representative sample to, to review. Thank you for the opportunity That's, to testify. Hopefully we can uh, work that out. That's the goal. Mr. Rodriguez, if you Good morning, uh, Chairman Greenlee and members of Council. My name is Angel Rodriguez. I'm Vice President of Asociación Potriqueños en Marcha. Um, I'm here in support of the bill that, uh, this morning. Um, APM provides affordable housing, affordable rental housing to 265 families in eastern North Philadelphia. We service predominantly uh, those families whose income is below 60% of AMI. 
Um, just to put a fine point, what we're talking about are single moms with kids, and the median income in our targeted development area is 5000 to 15000 for that family on an annual basis. So there's not a lot of cash flow or wiggle room in those households to um, support any kind of rent increases. Um, the proposed 2017-2018 uh, fiscal year assessments jeopardize our ability, though, to uh, control the costs and sustain the affordability of our rental units. Um, previously, with the fixed 22-5, uh, we've been able to, you know, provide um, service, these, the, maintain this housing, and also go for larger uh, projects based on this rate. But currently, um, our real estate, and just to give you an example, currently our real estate taxes are approximately 79000 There's a chart on uh, the second right. page of my Yeah, I was going to reference it. I think that chart's yeah. very illustrative. And some of these increases as much. The highest I see is 302%. 300, yeah. That's a lot of money. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and what we're going to end up looking at is uh, $145,000 at the end. Now that's, that pencils out to about an 85% increase in our total portfolio for affordable rental housing. So we've been talking, you've heard this today, um, I do quite a bit of fundraising for APM. Um, usually in your grants you're restricted to 10% administrative fees which these tax increases would be considered. Nobody wants to fund a tax increase. They'd rather see their dollars put to use in direct manner with, a for, with needy populations. Another critical issue um, to APM in our in industry is that we need to maintain the affordable rental housing and develop new units. Um, and that concerns us because they, our performance will not pencil out. For example, our most recent development project is, in the, is the preservation of 80 affordable rental units, which is scheduled for closing this month. Our operating budget uh, shows real estate taxes based on the 22.5 rate. Um, resulting in a tax uh, taxes for us at 22, uh, 25 600 a year. The proposed increase would increase our ta uh, it'll increase to forty four thousand dollars, resulting in an eighteen thousand four hundred dollar differential gap. We're sitting here desperately thinking, how would we pay that in our operating budget moving forward? So, also one thing to note is that uh, as per federal guidelines, low income housing uh, rents are capped. Our income and expenses are calculated on 2% growth rate. Um, we're left like then wondering how we're going to get additional revenue to cover the drastic increase. We certainly cannot ask that of our residents. So um, we strongly support the passage of Bill 170564 and strongly urge council to pass the bill prior to the summer recess. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, before you go, is there anyone else here other in this panel before we go back to Mr. Piper that wants to testify? Okay, good. Uh, Ms. Felger, we, we have your written testimony. I'm, yes. We could I'll, be brief because I, I really want to get back to Mr. Piper exactly. and see if we can work this out. I'm Lee Felger, president of Penrose Management Company here in Philadelphia. And we have been uh, here for many years and we have partnered with the city successfully on the creation of a lot of affordable housing. My testimony is uh, detailed and really echoes what the other speakers right. have presented here. Uh, I can only uh, reiterate that these properties run on razor thin margins. And when we have a sizable increase in any expense, it causes near catastrophic issues for the sustainability and for the financial success of these low income housing tax credit properties. So uh, I encourage the city to study this issue, take uh, commentary from industry experts, recognize that these are of low value in terms of market value, and that they consider uh, thoughtful input and predict, bring predictability to how this is done because as developers look at the city and they need the predictability of what they can understand what the real estate taxes are going to be. Investors, lenders, owners and developers need that kind of certainty and professional approach to how these values are determined. So with that I'll close and okay, uh, thank, thank you for giving me the I, opportunity. Let to me just add I'm certainly familiar as your headquarters about two blocks from where I live. I, I certainly know of all the uh, Great work uh, Penrose has done in 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 those in the communities around the city. Thank you. And just I guess for uh, Mr. Rodriguez too, just quickly before we get to Mr. Feldman, the question I asked Mr. Bright, you folks I assume have information audits and all that would certainly could back up uh, uh, any appeal or pre-appeal that you might yes. have to do. Yes. And they're open and available to okay. the public. Thank you. That's all I need to know. 
Mr. Feldman. Yeah, and I'll just introduce myself and give you the point of my testimony, which you have. Okay. Um, so, um, good afternoon, Thank Chairman. You. Chairman Greenlee, Vice Chairman uh, Green, members of the Law and Government Committee, I'm here to testify in support of the proposed Bill 170564. My name is David Feldman. I am here today as President of Right Sized Homes, a housing development and policy consulting company concentrating on affordable housing development and, su and supporting sustainable neighborhoods. Um, the point of my testimony is a story that's really related here, and the story uh, relates to a, a, a slightly different aspect of affordable housing that's impacted that this bill hopefully will um, increase awareness at OPA in their assessments. Uh, while low-income housing tax credits certainly are the lion's share of affordable housing and certainly on the rental side, there are hundreds of units of affordable home ownership that similarly have restrictions. And because they're scattered site, we don't have public audits, they're not as readily accessible. It requires OPA to be in closer coordination with, for instance, the Department of um, Housing and Community Development. Some of these, in fact, more recently have been developed where the city has given land, let's say workforce development through the land bank or places like New Kensington and CDC did um, with Awesome Town where there, the city doesn't have a soft second mortgage. In many places, the city at least has a soft second mortgage where there's something on record that shows it's a restricted property. Some of these have been more private agreements. Um, the land bank ones have soft second agreements. Um, so they're a little harder to dig at, and the example I gave here was one from one of the properties I did through the Neighborhood Stabilization Program under contract with the Redevelopment Authority, where when it went for resale, um, the first day there were half a dozen investors willing to pay 30% over because the neighborhood could support rentals that would throw off income, and the house had to sell it at a lower point because the restriction for home ownership meant that the person who bought it had to be a certain income, which limited the sale price of the house. So. It's not as obvious as a low-income housing tax credit, but we have hundreds and hundreds of units throughout the city where we have low-income homeowners who are restricted in the value they could receive at resale. And this value, you know, we hear about even with tax abatements as a land value, the land value is less than their neighbor's house because the restriction is not just on the building but on the land as well and what can be developed on that land. So the square foot of land in the house that has a soft second mortgage is not worth the same as a vacant lot next door that a private person can build a three-story house and sell for 500000 Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you for all the work you do. All right, Mr. Piper, can you come back up, please? Yeah, it's still morning. Good morning uh, again. <laughs> uh, let me ask you, I mean, this is kind of repeat, I guess, of what I said earlier, but uh, given what Councilman Neal, Councilman Green has said, you heard the testimony. Yes. Um, there's obviously, I think everybody admits there's information here that you didn't have in, in setting these assessments. Yes. Am I correct in that? Okay. As there always is with assessments, yes. Well, there is, but in, in this case, we're talking about large groups. Sure. You know, between Project Home, APM, Penrose, everybody, yeah. right? Um, it seems to me to make sense, rather than having all these folks go through appeal, is there a way, given what Councilman O'Neill said, to sit down and kind of work this out so that doesn't have to happen? If they provide this information, maybe, it, you know, it, that... that it, the appeals won't be necessary. Um, Councilman Greenlee, I, I would agree. What okay. you just described is essentially the <coughs> essence of the first level review process. Okay. So yeah. that taxpayers don't have to go to an appeal. They can share information with OPA mm -hmm. that would be helpful to us and helpful to the taxpayer to make the, their case that their assessment is wrong. So we okay. would welcome um, for instance, Mr. Bright came up and said he has the audits of his clients, I think, and we would ask that he forward that to us. And, and by the way, I, I, I have to echo what Councilman O'Neill said about um, Mr. Bright. We also recognize him as a nationally respected attorney in, in, in several different um, fields. So, mm -hmm. so, so we appreciate his input into this. And I think some of the other groups said they also have that information. I think Project we, Home. We, we, we would actually, and I will say this on record, um, <clears throat> 
Because going forward for 2019 is essentially what we're looking at doing, but even for 2018, um, we were hoping to get some of these organiz organizations come in and share the information with us on uh, first level review, informal appeals. Um, we were a little concerned that um, uh, we, 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 we were missing something because when the, the, the deadline for filing those appeals was May the 26th, I believe, for the first mailing. And we had a couple thousand uh, first level reviews come in, but when we checked to see which ones were filed on behalf of um, these particular projects, it was zero. So um, we still, even at this point though, so we can kind of move forward on this issue, we would welcome that information, whether they file a first level review appeal or not. Um, we would take that information and look at the assessment for the ones that send all the audits in. We, we need more than just a handful, though. Okay, well, I think they're certainly willing to give whatever information you need, it sounds like. Uh, as far as the bill itself, as, again, as Councilman, you know, Councilman Green have been talking about, um, what, I mean, is there something, because I, I think the, the uh, uh, idea of the committee today is to pass the bill out of committee, okay? But as Councilman O'Neill said, if, if anything can be worked out in between time or there's wording that you think should be put in. I mean, it seems like we're not that far apart. We're, we're not. And all we're talking about, again, is, is adhering to state law. <clears throat> it is unusual, as the councilman said, to have to pass a law to say you got to pay attention to state law. But we thought that there was some, some stuff missing here that Mr. we chairman. had to do that. So, um, Mr. Chairman, if I yeah, could just please. interject. What I'm trying to avoid and where I think we're going, and I'm certainly was hoping we wouldn't be, is that these entities, individuals and organizations, shouldn't have to be filing any first level appeal. Um, the burden should be on OPA to listen to Mr. Bright, Mr. Mm -hmm. Wetzel, because this is based on law. This isn't based on conversations held in some, you know, restaurant. These are, these are legal matters that where everything is set up, the state has intervened, the courts have intervened, and we're not following it. Mm -hmm. And that's the learning curve that I'm hoping we can accomplish in a very short time. If we, if we get into first level appeals, we're in a totally different ballpark uh, because first of all, there's too many of them. Secondly, they all kind of fit in the same, in, on the same um, lazy Susan, they may be a little, uh, the nuances, you know, between and among the, the various uh, uh, kinds of uh, tax credit projects and things, but they're all very, very similar and they both are dealing with the realities of um, both law and economics. And I, I just think if, if we're talking about first level appeal still during this hearing, um, OPA is missing it. And um, if, if they don't want to sit down and try to understand it better, um, whether it's from Mr. Wetzel, Mr. Bright, or others, uh, what they're missing, because they're missing it. I'm telling you, they're missing it. This is not, when, when someone says, this puts us out of business. When someone says, right. based on law, we are taking the average of the, uh, the valuations. And the lower valuations have agreed not to appeal as a group following the law and the higher ones and the lower ones agree on the middle, on the midpoint as their value that saves untold public dollars in terms of trying to figure out each individual one i it's easy to understand if they don't if they don't understand this by the time bill the bill passes i'm happy to vote for it i i'm just sad that we have to deal with this as if it were a uh, an other property, just one of many that are being assessed and and going through the appeal process. These are totally different. Um, they they don't stand up to the to the uh, to the measure of, of valuations in in um, um, ninety nine percent of the properties in the city. Probably uh, uh, they are an exception, and it's a very understandable exception. Uh, and if 
OPA doesn't understand this in the next two weeks. We have no choice. I mean, no. I just, I particularly believe they're, they're violating state law. They're not following state law. You can use a softer term. Uh, they don't understand state law. I, I don't care how we keep softening it. It's not being followed. And if they're going to continue to do that and stand by this as if it's a center city property that just went up or a, uh -huh. or a uh, you know, commercial corridor property or an a, a, a industrial property that just took a, a, had a big increase and say, you know, we didn't see the first level of appeal. I'm really disappointed that that's so far, not only, only this after this hearing's almost, you know, at, at this point almost over, but uh, I know there's been contact between right. uh, the various parties. I was just thought this, there could be maybe, you know, a summit, real quick summit held on this where everything gets explained, you agree or not. I think they'll agree if they absorb it, follow, follow through on it. It's not, this is not first level appeal situations. This is not assessment appeal situations. This Cut. is following um, the law and I think we're missing it. That's all. Okay. Councilman, I agree with you. I, I, I mean, Mr. Piper used the word first level. I, I was thinking you used the word summit. That's what I'm kind of thinking about too, is getting everybody together and seeing that this is different. And I don't know if you have any other response, Mr. Piper. Yeah, I, I'd like to comment. First of all, um, we don't believe we've done anything to violate state law or not follow state law. And what I um, referred to in my testimony was our formula for valuing these properties, which we did say we would forward, okay? No first level review was required for us to forward this to council. Now, having said that, um, we have had several summits and unfortunately, um, I think that's kind of how we've come to where we are now because what we've been asking for is the complete universe of audits and we have not received it yet. And that's the only thing that we would need to be able to agree to sit down and take a look at these. Um, we don't believe we're violating state law and... Mr. Uh, Chairman, if I could interject, yeah. it might be a perfect time to ask Mr. Wetzel to come up. He he's, doesn't have the, um, the burden of having to practice in front of OPA and the, and the courts and, and um, uh, being reserved in his criticism or his, his okay. statements. And, and because <coughs> Mr. Right. Wetzel convinced me in a very short period of time that what this bill is doing is having the city now further explain the state law and add some other provisions to make it, it workable because we're not following it. Okay, let me, let me suggest this. Let's, let Ms. Piper complete a statement. Mm -hmm. Okay. Call Mr. <coughs> but that's it. Once he said we're not following state law, that's where I think the point comes where, uh, I got you, where I Mr. Got you, Wetzel but can let, add but, some clarity. Okay. Yeah, but I think that, that is what it comes down to, whether or not we're following state law. Sure. And, and, and usually... Um, we're not deliberately going about doing an assessment and disregarding state law. Um, we're never doing that. And if um, someone can okay. show us we are, but it, it, it has to be a little bit more than someone just asserting that we're not following state law. For us, for us to look at the assessments, I'll say. Okay. All right. As, as Councilman as Neil suggested, Mr. Wetzel, could you just come up for us to the witness table a minute? And I don't want to get into a a debate right here but I think I think it does make sense for because I think we all rely on her to, to uh, give the inf uh, give us information so maybe just get that on record as where the seem to be the gap here. so could you just identify yourself uh, Herb Wessel I'm um, executive director for housing and community development for City Council's technical staff okay um, you have You've been sitting here. You heard, you're here. Yeah, I, I think. And again, Senator, without getting into debate, what, why do you what do you feel is lacking that OPA is? is if not you doing? if you go back to testimony in 2012, uh, where Mr. McKeithen explained the methodology by which low-income housing tax credit projects would be evaluated in Philadelphia, it was on the income approach and the gathering of audits from these individual entities. Uh, there's nothing that I know of, uh, unless OPA can correct that, that they asked for or received these audits when they created the increase in the assessments. Okay. So you're saying if they had, that information has never been... 
gotten, and that's crucial. No, and, and in that testimony by Mr. McKeithen, it was it was made clear that they were that these audits were publicly available at any time from the Pennsylvania Housing Finance Agency, and we have indicated consistently over time that we believe that all these entities would be willingly provide these mm -hmm. audits because they really show that these projects have little or no value. And I think that's been brought out today by the various witnesses. Right. Um, again, without getting into a big debate, Mr. Piper, you have any, any, it's, it's, it, this seems to always go back to not having certain information. Correct. Mr. Wetzel is saying way back in 2012, it was talked about getting that information. That was still going don't use it though, so, or it we sounds don't. like you don't use it. We don't have it. How difficult is it to get it? Well, we've recently, um, and I'm going to ask Mr. Doyle to come up, <clears throat> since this has become an issue of whether or not we can easily get it or okay. they're not going to provide it, um, Mr. Doyle has actually um, dealt with some of these agencies and, and some of these projects and has made some effort to, to, to try to get a comprehensive is universe. it not public? Is it not, and maybe he can answer it, is it not public information? I, I don't know if it's public information or if some of it is subject to um, maybe right to no request because there's some confidentiality in it. Um, we haven't gotten it from the entities themselves. Right. So, well, but, but I, I'd like not to make clear. Back, they, right, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Just to go yeah. back, back on that. You haven't gotten the entity, so they say they're very willing to give it, but I don't want to keep going back and forth. That's that. good news. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's always been the I case. I have a feeling, Councilman O'Neill, we're not going to work this out today, but anyway. <laughs> Mr. Did, Mr. Doyle, is that you? Yeah. Did you want to say anything on this? Please just state your name for the record. <laughs> My name is John Doyle. I'm a commercial real estate appraiser. Yeah. I'm also a consultant to PHFA as okay. well as the city. And I'm also a consultant to HUD headquarters, and I've appraised low-income housing tax credit properties since 1993. Okay, to focus on... You, you I've made requests to my colleagues at PHFA for the population of income and expenses for low-income housing tax credit properties inside the city of Philadelphia. And that request is still pending, and we haven't, I haven't received a reply yet. So you have to get from them, that's not something you can just find publicly? We don't know, we, we don't know yet. And Pardon me? I'm sorry. We, I don't know if the information is coming yet. Coming from? From PHFA, oh, you, to whom I made PHFA. the request. Okay. Yes. All right. Okay. All right. Mr. Wetzel, and then it doesn't look like we're, we're I think we should move on. Yeah, anyway. I, I, I agree. I think there is, what I know is that these requests could have been made and should have been made before any reassessment was done. The facts are that they weren't, and I think that's the crux of the problem right now. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Okay, thank you all. My great peace effort. Thanks. <laughs> United Nations will never hire me. Uh, thank you, Council. I tried. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. Um, that concludes our public hearing. We will now go into our public meeting and chair recognizes Councilman Green. Thank you, um, Chairman Greenlee. I move that bill number 170401 be, be voted out of this committee with a um, rule suspension so the and so this bill can be heard as first, ne first session of our next meeting in council. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, bill number 170401's report as committee with a favorable recommendation with a rule suspension. Councilman Green. Thank you, Chairman Greenlee. Um, I move that bill number 170204 um, be amended. The amendment has circulated to all members of this committee. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, the, the amendment is adopted. Councilman Green? Thank you, Councilman uh, Chairman Greenlee. Um, I, I move that Bill Number 170204, as amended, be voted out of this committee with a favorable recommendation, favorable recommendation and that the bills of council be suspended so this bill could have its first reading in our next session of council. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 
Opposed? Hearing on Bill Number 170204 as amended is reported out as committee with favorably with a rule suspension. Councilman Green. Thank you, Chairman Greenlee. I move that Bill Number 170564. Um, that's that's been the amendment. Yeah. Right. The amendment to Bill Number 170564, um, which has been circled with all members of this committee, um, be amended. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, the, the amendment is adopted. Councilman Green. Thank you, Chairman Greenlee. I move that bill number 170564, which as amended, be voted out of this committee with a favorable recommendation and at the rules of council be suspended so it'll be heard as next session of council. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, bill number 170564 is reported as committee favorably. Uh, as amended with a rule suspension. That concludes the business of the Law and Government Committee today. Thank you all for your participation.